it's a uh, beginner-ish level. Um, we'd like you to know a little bit about um, Linux, but pretty much a step-by-step guide. So, and my slides, this set of slides is online now. Um, you can go and get them now, or I'll leave this up at the end anyway. Um, on our website. Sorry about the confidence of your hours. I'll put that up again later, so don't panic if you didn't get it. So, um, getting started, what do you need? Well, obviously, the first thing you need is a virtual machine, virtual server of some sort. Uh, you can either <coughs> go online, the Lino, Rackspace, Gandhi, one of dozens and dozens of people. I should say, Pulsar, of course, is the There's obviously, you know, millions of people out there who want to put yourself in your server. Or you can run one on your own computer from messing around with VMware or VirtualBox or a number of uh, um, virtual machine managing stuff there uh, on your own local computer, which is what I was going to do. Um, I usually use VirtualBox. <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, there's a, there's a kind of a whole thing about you know, VMware is better than VirtualBox and VirtualBox crashes your machine and all the rest of it. Well, there's one really, really good reason to use VirtualBox, and that's Vagrant. Who knows what Vagrant is? About half of you. Right, well, for those who don't know what Vagrant is, Vagrant is actually um, a program that makes it really, really easy to spin up and destroy and create new ones and build images of um, virtual machines. So essentially, uh, what it does is it makes the job of creating a computer copy on your local computer really, really easy. Um, I'm not going to go into that. There's a couple of URLs there. The Vagrant Hub is the main site, and vagrantbox.es is a website where you can actually go and download pre-prepared minimal images of various Linux distributions of play which is useful. But, a uh, quick plug for Marcus, who's doing a session at 1613 BG 104, Vagrant and Crash Course. If you want to know more about Vagrant, go there. Um, so we're assuming we're using Linux. Um, as I've got it there, it says we could use Ubuntu, Red Hat, uh, Debian, Mint, you know, we know this. Dozens and dozens of flavors of Linux over there, out there. Uh, for this demo, I'm using um, CentOS, or I was going to use CentOS, um, which <laughs> may, may not go down, down very well with everybody. I know there's usually more Ubuntu and Debian fans than, than Red Hat fans in the room. Um, don't go. Uh, why, why I'm using CentOS is basically I, I'm lazy. Um, I found a really good uh, tutorial as I was kind of researching putting this together. Uh, which I'll share the link with you, um, which actually covers a lot of what I was going to say, so you can go away and run through it. Um, and it doesn't really matter anyway, because the packages we're going to look at are available on pretty much any Linux distribution, so it's just a case of actually modifying the steps slightly. Um, so the principles uh, of what we're doing don't change. Um, and at the end, I've got some notes on Ubuntu and Debian and getting the same packages from them as well. So, Please stay. Um, so, to prepare, uh, I downloaded uh, a basic CentOS box, base box for Vagrant. So, what Vagrant does basically is you can define, you can download and create base boxes that then allows you to very quickly create copies of the machine. So, I downloaded uh, a CentOS minimal install base box from that um, vagrantbox.es website that was earlier in the slide. <coughs> Fired it up, brought up the network interface, and I installed two packages, Young Priorities, which if you're using Red Hat or something like it, it uses the Young Package Manager. Young Priorities is a very handy and quite important tool um, because it basically allows you to prioritize the importance of your different software repositories, and that way you don't end up tripping over sort of having dependencies on the wrong uh, packages um, going on. So, um, I installed that. I also installed Nano. Um, as I said, I know, but I hate you. My, my brain just doesn't work with well, it. So. <laughs> um, the next thing I did for CentOS is I installed a couple of repositories. Now, whether you're on CentOS or Red Hat, or whether you're on Debian, yeah, you won't find everything you need in the core repositories because some of this stuff is quite big against you. So, um, there's two things. Um, there's the extended repository for Red Hat, Epel, which most people who have uh, Red Hat based um, system will almost certainly have installed because it's got everything useful. Um, and the second one is um, this Remy repository, which is just run by um, a guy in France who's a CentOS fan and 
very kindly packages lots of interesting stuff like the latest version of PHP ready to use in Red Hat, which isn't normally available. For those of you who don't know, Red Hat has quite a conservative um, release chart. Uh, it has to be converted by the computer every time you try and run it. Um, a process called compiling into, into code that the machine can actually understand. Uh, and what APC and other operating fashion do is they save that compiled piece of PHP so that you don't have to compile it every time you get to page. So it's just a performance enhancement. So generally speaking, it's, it's a pretty much a no-brainer if you're running any kind of PHP application. Install it and configure APC, you'll see the game. So we'll put APC in there. Uh, and then, just like we did with MySQL, we want to make sure that these two services we just installed uh, will actually fire up um, when uh, the machine is rebooted. So onto the configuration. Um, firstly, on my blank center Xbox, the uh, center S box, the first stumbling block was that the firewall was only allowing an SSH through. So just a couple of simple. Um, firewall rules to add into the standard Linux IP tables firewall. Um, what I would have shown you <coughs> had my computer worked is that the order of these is important. So I haven't actually put this in the slide because I was going to demonstrate it. But what you've got when you open the IP tables rules is you have a load of accept rules and then a load of reject rules. If you just paste things at the bottom, they won't have any effect. They have to happen before the packet rejection lines because otherwise your packets have just been thrown out before the packet tables gets told to accept them. So um, the order is significant. I'll put a note when I write this up in the blog post, I'll put a note to that effect as well. So um, there will be a follow up to this. Uh, but yeah, obviously you've got to make sure that your web server is allowed through and you cover port 80 for standard web traffic and port 443 for SSL secure HTTPS. Next, uh, we've got a bit of PHP uh, configuration to do. APC um, for Drupal. APC uh, ideally needs 128 uh, megabytes of RAM assigned to it. Parameter is called SHM size. Um, the APC config file is usually in slash etc slash php.d. Um, it may be in other locations, but what you're looking for is a file called apc.ini. APC and in that, you will find an SHM size line. If you don't add it, you can set it to 128M. Um, it will normally default to 32, which is too small <coughs> to hold the Drupal application, so you've just got to boost that up a little bit. Um, then there's the Nginx configuration itself. So obviously, you've got to get Drupal's HTML access files that I mentioned earlier into an Nginx config, um, and you've also got to configure Nginx as PHP requests to fast CGR to PHP FPL. Because out of the box, Nginx has no idea what to do with a PHP file. So what you have to do is you have to add rules that say to it, right, if you find a PHP file, pass it over to this program here, because it knows what to do with it, and it will give it back to you later. Um, and we actually have a considered a consolidated configuration file with all of our Drupal content, which we're happy to share um, with people again. I will reference that um, at a later date. Um, so, to look at the actual configurations, as I say, we've got our APC.ini file. We just add, add the necessary line in there to, to grow the size of the APC opcode cache. Um, we just do a couple of minor tweaks. Uh, these are in the standard how, how to, to the Nginx config, just to allow it to uh, have multiple concurrent workers going at once and also bring the time out, uh, time right down because we don't want um, we don't want the web server to be sitting there still trying to serve something that's clearly died for two minutes. So we put the time out. That's two seconds is quite aggressive. I think that standard is more like five, but that's just sort of straight down the two. Um, then we need to go into the default configuration for Nginx and um, obviously it's fairly crucial that we tell Nginx that one of the allowable index files is .php, uh, because by default it just has these two. Um, so you just find the index line and pop in index.php. Um, and then in order to actually tell Nginx um, where it needs to send PHP files for, we have this 
location directive, which is basically just saying, if you find the PHP file, this is where it lives. Uh, if, if, if you fail to uh, find it, then this shows standard 404. Fast CGI uh, is actually running um, over a TCP port, so you actually just tell it where it can find um, Fast CGI on localhost port 9000. Um, the index file, and then this is also a pattern that it needs to have things uh, passed through to it. And then finally, there's a file that's installed by um, Fast CGI itself, which has all the uh, configuration parameters for it. Um, but you can pretty much leave those alone. Um, and if you just copy and paste that in, that should, that should work. One last thing, at the end of the uh, configuration file, normally commented out, there's reference to um, stopping people from being able to access mm -hmm. .htm access and .htm password files, because obviously Nginx doesn't use them, but they might be lying around if you ported the application um, from from another server, or if you've just kind of you know, extracted and used um, core group. So, uh, so yeah, that just basically makes sure that access to those files is denied for security reasons. And then, what I would have done <laughs> would be to just whisk through the steps of actually creating, uh, installing Drupal quickly, uh, demonstrate to you that actually, that actually works, and I would have had uh, Drupal up running in a browser. But unfortunately, as I say, my, my computer is refusing to play with this. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you'll just have to take my word for it. When you can try it later yourself, um, then follow these steps and then just set the permissions correctly on the settings file and the files directory and you should be able to run um, the Drupal installer. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the configuration for um, the, the moving the .ht access file that comes with Drupal into Nginx, well Nginx, keep this page, wiki.nginx.org slash Drupal, if you go there they've got full config file you can just include um, which does everything that Drupal's .htaccess file does, plus some other handy fixes like some stuff with some image cache issues, some known Drupal 7 issues, etc. All sorts of everything's quite well documented in comments, so just you can, you can just rip that down. So um, the obvious question is, where's Varnish in all of this? I'm assuming that sort of half the room again roughly knows what Varnish is. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, for those who don't, Varnish is um, a HTT proxy that is often used um, with Drupal to speed up the serving of pages by basically keeping copies of the fully built pages in front of Drupal. So if you're an anonymous user visiting a site and you want to um, you go to visit a page, um, instead of asking Drupal for that page, you ask Varnish first. And Varnish has a copy, it will ping that back really, really fast. Um, if it doesn't, it will pass the applicant, it will pass the request back to the application, Drupal will build the page, pass it back out, and Varnish will take the copies and pass it through so that next time it will happen. Um, why don't we include Varnish? Well, we do, but there has to, there has to be at least 4 gigabyte of, of RAM on the server in our experience. So if you're talking about, like, say, a little 2 gigabyte um, Lino, something like that, uh, our experience has been that the amount of RAM that we allocate to and the amount of resource that Varnish um, uses up doesn't actually gain you anything because Nginx in and of itself is very, very fast. If you've got Drupal cache optimized, um, then that's very, very fast. Um, and actually, the overhead of running Varnish is, is basically more than the gain you get by running Varnish. That all changes when you get to a 4 gigabyte machine and it's worth installing Varnish at that point, which is available in all the standard repositories. Um, again, they are freely available Varnish configs on, on the internet, so you can just go and look it up. Um, but, as I say, not advisable on smaller machines. Fine, knock yourself out if you've got 4 gigabyte RAM or more. A few other bits and pieces worth mentioning. Um, most of you who are developers probably know about and care about Drush, um, the command line tool for Drupal. There's a, obviously fairly decent support for installing Drush. There's also, I think there's a Peckle pair module or something for Drush as well. Um, our, one of our system administrators, Mig, has an aversion to pair, so 
he's actually packaged up Drush and we keep that in the public repository. So if you want to uh, add our repository to your Debian, Debian 6 server, um, then you feel free to, to pull, pull Drush from us. We've got a few other bits in there, um, but most of that's to do with adding LDAP support and various things as we need it. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do have a .dev Drush if you want it. Um, so what about Ubuntu and Debian? I promised I'd mention them. Well, most of this stuff is in the standard uh, Debian 6 and Ubuntu repositories. The only thing you'll find uh, missing, uh, I think, is PHP FPM. And you will find that in the .deb um, repository, which again is a trusted resource for the Debian community. And that's where we pull PHP FPM from ourselves. I've just referenced a thread there which goes through similar steps for Debian if anybody's on Debian or Ubuntu. Um, I wanted to mention Memcache, Memcache D. Uh, I will, I'll ask it again. Who, who knows what Memcache is? Yeah, okay. It's a distributed caching engine for Linux. It's it, it pretty handy because uh, one of the nice things about it is that it can, it can scale across multiple machines. So if you have big uh, infrastructure issues, then you know, scaling out the Memcache is, is quite comfortable. Um, but we recommend running it even on fairly small um, installations. I mean, I haven't included it in the demonstration because it does have the tendency on installing the Drupal module and configuring it properly. Um, but it does make a big difference. Basically what it does is it moves Drupal's cache from using the MySQL database uh, into using Memcache instead and Memcache is significantly Plus, of course, you've got the advantage of taking load off the database, which is usually the bottom there. In small drip architecture. So the more you can get away from the database, the better. MySQL is a very quick way of serving Drupal's cache. So we recommend it. It's widely available, um, and we usually give it a lot of time to run around. Seems to be about how it needs to efficiently cache most Drupal websites. Um, yeah, that's me. I think I've run out of slides. I'm really sorry I couldn't actually do this on the, on the end of the go. Um, it's a shame, but uh, uh, I've, I've been told I've got five more minutes, so we've got five minutes for questions if anyone has any. Yes? Do you have any, any reason to choose one over there? Because in many cases, they seem to be doing a lot of the same job. Yeah, uh, I, I, I have looked at this once, I have to be very busy with my, my understanding, and I might be wrong, I'm working on it for a moment, but my understanding is that this is more like a kind of value data store rather than a but I guess it doesn't really matter. No, no particular reason. Just uh, I guess Memcache is just older and more trusted. So <laughs> probably no better reason than that to be honest. Um, have you got any suggestions for uh, tuning things once you've got them in place? Generally, I mean, we use MySQL Tuner for tuning that bit, but is there anything that could? You know, you, you mentioned the configuration for Nginx, say you've got might have some client that doesn't suit that configuration, if you've got any um, suggestions? Well, it wouldn't, well, wouldn't suit that configuration. I mean, well, I have to say, normally we just install the standard, in fact, we always just install the kind of standard Drupal script that Nginx recommended. We've never had any reason to go off piece with that. I mean, the only thing I could think of with Apache is that, I mean, for example, if you've got quite a high memory site, do you want to? To tune your Apache instance so that you you don't you never fire up too many workers, for example. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, you can do that. I mean, obviously, uh, many of the Apache directives are the same as they are for any next. So right. these you can you can set the numbers of worker processes, you can set the maximum connections and all that sort of stuff. And it still stands. You can probably just get away with slightly bigger numbers, but you yeah. know, on an application by application basis, there's no substitute for just seeing where the limits are for each application you know if we do the site even two people are doing exactly the same thing we feel very different when we use different things and then we use this so um, yeah it's just a case of uh, play. I don't have any specific advice we can we can pester Jamie later and <laughs> see what I guess it's just if in doubt bring it to something in yeah, yeah and there's some great tools out magic. there yeah, yeah. Well, there's some great tools out there if you want to if you're having performance problems and you want to actually find out um, what's going on. Uh, we've been using the Relic recently. 
recently, which is absolutely fabulous um, for basically showing exactly what's going on. You can, you can hit a page. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, you can hit a page. Uh, if nobody's seen it, you can, you can hit a page and then you can um, drill down into that page and see the function calls and see which ones are slowest and then hit those and see you know, what was slowing it down. Uh, and that's, that's a fabulous tool. Um, there's also one called Trace Critics, which we've got there right the table, which is good. It's like New Relic, but it's uh, the, the New Relic pricing model that is the server and it's like to it. Uh, we tried one of it, it didn't work, and it was in the room, yeah, he's laughing at me. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say two gig is probably the minimum you can get away with. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, everybody.